We are in the third week of our passionate series. The first week we spoke about let's go. I was running all over the stage like a madman, inspiring us to go. Last week we sp spoke about heart and soul. And uh, today I want to read to you two very popular Bible stories. Um, if you've never heard them before, no harm, no foul. If you've been in church any length of time, I'm sure you've heard at least one of these two stories. And it's always hard preaching very familiar stories because everybody already knows them and they already know everything about them. But I'm going to endeavor to show you some things today that I just learned, that I just saw reading the Bible, okay? Reading these stories. Story number one is Jesus' first miracle in Cana of Galilee. Does anybody know what his first miracle was? Turning water into wine. Yep, and if you didn't know that, shame on you. You know nothing about the Bible. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Jesus' first miracle in Cana of Galilee was turning water into wine. So let's read it. Let's see what that story says. It's in John chapter 2, and it says this. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. So they were not wedding crashers. They were invited. They were supposed to be there. When the wine was gone, you know what that means, right? Yeah. Party's over. <laughs> when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Jesus says to her, woman, yo, I would love to talk to my mom that way. <laughs> I would love to have said it to my mom one time when I was young. Woman, why do you involve me? Why are you bothering me with these petty things, right? He says, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants. So in total mom fashion, she absolutely ignores anything he just said. She moves him to the side and she says, do whatever Jesus tells you, right? She motions to the servants, do whatever my son tells you. And so I've got this first question that we have to ask is, why did, Jesus, why did Mary involve Jesus? Why did she ask him to do something? Like, so we have to ask, the first thing is, what did she expect him to do? Was he supposed to jump on the donkey and go down to the local liquor store and get more wine? What was she asking him to do? Maybe, maybe she knew that Jesus could perform miracles. Maybe he did little miracles at home as a kid, right? Like any of us would do. Let's give an example. I'm totally making all this up because the Bible doesn't say it. But let's just play for a second, can we? Sitting at home one day, and Mary says to Jesus, Jesus, would you go get me a glass of water? And like every other teenager, young kid, doesn't want to get up from watching TV to go get his mom a drink. So he just reaches over, touches her cup, boop, fills it up. Right? Huh? Like, I'm thinking that he did stuff like that. How else would she know to say... Jesus, do something about this. They need more wine. Huh? So, Jesus does something. And in typical Jesus fashion, he does it kind of like, all right, you going to make me do something I don't want to do? I'm going to show you. Ever did that? Parents make you do something you don't want to do? So you're like, all right, you going to make me do something I don't want to do? I'm going to show you. Huh? Nobody? Nobody? Nobody's rebellious in here. <laughs> My parents made me be in every single church play that there ever was in the history <laughs> of the church. Made me with weeping and gnashing of teeth. I've been in every church play since 1982, just so you guys all know. Go watch the video footage. So she's like, all right, you want me to do something? I'm going to do something. Watch this. Watch what it says here. Nearby stood six stone jars the kind used 
by Jews during ceremonial washing. Jesus goes and says, hey, bring me those pots right there. The nastiest pots. The dirtiest pots. I mean, they wash their hands in those pots before eating, after eating, after using the bathroom. This is, this is that pot. It's dirty. It's nasty. He goes, oh, <laughs> you, <laughs> you want me to make some wine? Bring me those pots. Bring me those nasty ones. They bring them to him. And Jesus does this on purpose. On purpose. He wants to take these dirty containers to do his first miracle. And this is symbolic. It's symbolic of his transformation of human rituals into a divine sacrifice. It's symbolic of him taking dirty vessels, dirty containers called me and you, and placing new wine, fresh wine, the best wine inside of each and every one of us. Watch this. It says each of those containers could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And so they filled them to the brim. I love the fact that the story specifically told us that. Because if I ask my kids, get me a glass of water, nine times out of 10, they're bringing me a half a cup of water. Right? <laughs> I was like, I didn't ask for a kid-sized cup of water. They filled them to the brim that they didn't hold anything back. They filled them to overflowing all the way to the brim. And if you've ever felt like you're missing something in your life, like maybe God cheated you and didn't give you everything that you need, I want to tell you today that God has filled you to the brim. He's filled you to the brim. He's filled you up to the top. Now, you may not see it. You may not recognize it. You may even be angry at God because you think that you have some kind of deficiency and that God's not doing something for you. God's never been the problem. God's never been the problem. It's our lack of seeing the fact that he filled us to the brim, all right? Then he told them, now draw some out. Draw some of this dirty water out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn it out, draw the water out new. I can only imagine Jesus and the servants laughing. Laughing to themselves like, yo, this guy's about to drink. <laughs> Toilet water. He's about to drink toilet water. See, mom? This is what you <laughs> At what point did the water turn into wine? Did the guy actually drink water, but it tasted like wine? Did it turn into wine at the obedience of the servants? Did it turn into wine as they carted them from their location to the banquet hall? Then the then the, he called to the bridegroom, the master of the banquet called to the bridegroom to, a, to the side. He said, everyone brings out choice wine first. And then when everyone's drunk, they bring out the cheap wine. But you have saved the best until now. If you're in here today and you think your best days are behind you, Your best days are still ahead. Amen. Your tomorrow will be greater than your yesterday, and a year from now will be better than five years ago. Because God saves the best. He saves it. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory to his disciples. So this is Jesus' first miracle. That's a really cool first miracle. And today, we're not talking about alcohol. That's not the point here at all. My point here is I want to show you that 
in the same exact chapter of his first miracle is another very popular story. And I don't think too many people ever put these stories together, but they're literally back to back. Jesus leaves this wedding hall and goes to the temple. He goes to church. He leaves the wedding and he goes to church. And the second story is called Jesus Clears the Temple. It's the story in which he flips over tables and runs out the money changers. Did you know it was in the same chapter of the Bible? Did you realize that he went from the wedding hall to church? There's got to be a reason why. John chapter 2, now verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple courts. He found people at church selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of them from the temple courts. Both sheep and cattle he scattered, the coins of money changers and overturned their tables. To those he sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, and it was written by the psalmist David in the book of Psalm, a passion for the Lord's house burns within me. A passion for the Lord's house burns within me. We're talking about being passionate. Now I was really praying. I was like, Lord, why do you have these two stories back to back in the Bible? Why? What's the significance between the two? Is there any correlation between the two stories? In the first story, Jesus cleanses vessels that are known to be dirty. And he makes the best product ever tasted in those previously dirty vessels. Now he's going and he's cleaning up the church. He first symbolizes cleaning the people and then he's cleaning the house of God. He's cleaning up the church, right? The reason why Jesus was so upset was not because they had things for sale for people. The reason he was so upset was because the people who were selling these goods and exchanging the money had no heart for the house of God. They were not doing this stuff as fundraisers to advance the kingdom of God. They were getting rich off the people of God with no connection to God. They were using it as an environment to get rich and to make money and had no heart for the kingdom of God or what God was doing, right? His first act as a divine minister after he had done his first miracle was to clean the church, was to clean the house. And today, this topic that we're bringing to you is for the fact that there's some things at Family Church that we need to clean up. We need to clean some stuff up. And before you get all scared and all worried and like, oh my God, he's going to start calling out sins up in here. No. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. This is not a bad thing. It's actually a really great thing. Um, this is not a version of he was angry and sinned not. That's, that's not what we're talking about today at all. We just feel that there's some things that we can do better to advance the kingdom of God faster. There's things at this church that we can do better to advance the kingdom of God faster. And here's one of them, and I'm telling you right now, you're not going to see this coming because you're going to say, why are we even talking about this in church because we've never talked about this kind of stuff. We've never actually had a conversation about how church is done. And I want to talk about it today. Is that all right? So one of the things we need to clean up is we need to clean up our database. We need to clean up our database. Um, that's the backbone of what we do. That's how we know who is in our church. That's how we know 
what you're going through, who's connected to you. We can't clean up our database without your help, okay? So here's one thing. We don't always know who's in your house, who's in your household, okay? The truth of the matter is today, there are families who have multiple children with multiple last names. How would we know whose kid goes to who in our database system if we don't have them connected to households, right? People have moved. They've changed address. They've changed cell phone numbers. They've changed email addresses like they changed their hair. And if we want to stay connected to you, keep you up to date with what's happening in the church, invite you to functions and things that are going on, we need clean data. If anybody works in data management, you know how frustrating it is to work with dirty data, right? We need to clean it up. We need to clean up our data. We want to send you a text message on your birthday, but we'd have to know when your birthday is. We'd have to know when your birthday is, right? Now, I'll be honest, that's just one side of it. The other side of it is some of the events that we're doing are age appropriate. And so when you go to log in to, to sign up for a registration for an event, it'll only show you what you can sign up for based upon your age. But we have to have your birthday in order to know that, right? So we need help. We need help. We need help with your address, with your cell phone numbers, with your birthdays, with who's in your household. We have decided this year in 2020 to change the database system that we're using. There wasn't anything particularly wrong with the database that we were using. It was just very complicated and hard to use. Um, it was not user friendly for our team or for you as church members who wanted to get in and play around and discover what was going on in the church, okay? So the new system that we're looking at will make it easier for you to connect. Connect in connection groups, registration for events, online giving, all sorts of things. By changing our database, we can save the church around $7,000 a year. Okay? That $7,000 that can go to more outreach that can go to missions, that can go to making a difference other than just holding data, all right? The second thing we need to clean up is we need to clean up giving, giving, okay? Now, this is not one of those sermons where I'm gonna ask for anything. Hear me out. Last year, last year, 2019, we as a church spent $25,000 in bank fees. That's a salary, guys. $25,000 in bank fees. Specifically, processing fees. Processing fees. Every time a credit card is used, it's 2.9% plus 30 cents. Okay? Do the math. Over time, that adds up. 2.9% plus 30 cents. 2.9% plus 30 cents. Over time, over time, over time. In... 2019, we spent $25,000 in bank fees. That made me sick to my stomach as I looked over the budget this year. Sick to my stomach. That as someone who's supposed to be a steward over what God has trusted us with, that I would throw away $25,000 of kingdom money to secular banking. I don't believe that that's acceptable. I don't believe that's acceptable. That does not mean that we're going to get rid of technology and not do business. I'm smart enough to know that there's a, there's a cost in doing business. I get that. I understand that. But there are better ways, okay? There are better ways. There are better companies that have lower fees, right? I'm going to share with you one way that we can do this and save the kingdom a lot of money, Okay? My family has decided uh, to sign up for this, uh, our online giving system through something called, doing it through something called an ACH. You do this already, a lot of you do this already with your online banking, when you pay your bills online. Um, it's using your checking account instead of a credit card, okay? 
when you use your checking account instead of a credit card, it's a 25 cent flat fee, no matter the, no matter the amount. So if it's a dollar that you're donating, it's 25 cent fee. If it's $50,000, it's a 25 cent fee. No percentage, no percentage, okay? I'm just gonna give you like a little bit of reality on this. We as a church and the uh, missions that we're connected to, we could drill a well in another country for about $15,000. We could bring an entire village fresh running water for $15,000, which means we could probably do about two of those, just about two of those a year by changing how we're donating to the church. I'm just throwing this out there, okay? I'm, I feel a conviction within me to clean it up, to clean it up. That, that just because it's the way that other places and other people do it doesn't mean that that's the way that we have to do it. We can have kingdom mindset, stewardship mindset, kingdom focus that's saying, you know, I would give this way, okay? So uh, there's another great part of this uh, online giving is that you can set recurring giving. So you could set it, okay, um, every Sunday at one o'clock, donate X amount of dollars to Family Church and it will automatically run. And you can go in there and you can set that and tweak it and play with it all you want. Inside of, inside of the, the program, it will go ahead and show you everything that you've already donated for the year right in your profile. So if you would update your profile and set it up, everything that you've done, it lists all inside your profile. It will list inside your profile everything you've registered for, all the courses that you've taken, all of it right in your profile, and you can have access to that, which is pretty amazing. So the, the system that we're going to is called Planning Center Giving. We use it for a lot of the things that we already do now. If you're already connected in a connect group, a small group here at Family Church, you're already using it. Um, we've just decided to migrate our entire database over to their systems, okay? Today, we have computers and iPads in the lobby set up for each of you to uh, take advantage of it and, and update your information before you leave today. If that's not something that you want to do, um, we do have a handout that's available in the lobby that you can grab and take home and go through it. This new system also will update how we do check-ins in our children's ministry. Uh, here's a really cool thing, is once you log into the system, you can open it on your cell phone, and when you go down to the children's ministry, you can scan the barcode that's on your cell phone, and it'll check your kids into the children's ministry. Right? That's pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. This will give us a cleaner way to register your kids, to keep track of them, to be more secure, and, and you have the data right on your phone. No more losing your security sticker. <laughs> right? You can just show it and, and, and show your app. Right? This will give you more access to Family Church and what's going on. We've also redesigned our mobile website. 90% of people today use their smart device to go to websites. Uh, less and less people are using desktop computers and, and it's more mobile. With that, we've also decided to discontinue our mobile app. All right, the app that we have, the Family Church app. Uh, I'll tell you why. We've had 1,900 total downloads of the app, which may seem like a lot to you, but it's not very many, um, over the last three years. About 200 of you use it on a weekly basis, and you use it for three minutes. Okay? You use it for three minutes. That, uh, I have all the stats. Three minutes. Which means you're using it for giving. <laughs> We're not using it to watch sermons. We're not using it to do a lot of the things that the app was designed for. So we can save $800 a month. All right, $10,000 a year by not having the app. Okay? So if you go on the church website from your smart device, from your iPad, your iPhone, your Android, you will see that the website now looks just like the mobile app, right? It even has the buttons along the bottom that look just like an app. You cannot tell the difference 
and it costs us nothing to run it that way, okay? $800 a month, $10,000 a year, we've sa- we're, we'll save by getting rid of the app. The truth of the matter is, and I know that there was this big buzz about your company having to have an app. We're tired of having apps. Everybody's tired of downloading apps, right? So you can just go to the website, familychurchny.com from any of your smart devices, and you will have a full app experience. It is an SSL website, it is HTTPS, which means it's totally secure. Uh, So any of the giving or any of the things that you do through it, it's a secure site, all right? Um, Pastor Mike, why are we doing all this? Because at the end of every year, it's my job to sit down and create a budget for the next year. And I felt convicted inside myself that there was money being thrown away that could be used to advance the kingdom of God. That I don't think that we were doing anything wrong, but I think that we could just refocus. We could clean some stuff up. And one of our values here is we're always tweaking. We're always making stuff better. And I believe that the way that we're going this route is going to make our church experience and our engagement better. If you're here today, you're like, well, you know, Pastor Mike, I didn't really come to church to hear you talk about your church app and database. That's okay. I'll close out with this. Every single one of us could use a little cleaning up in our lives. Right? That's what the moral of the two stories were. All of us could use a little bit of cleaning up in our lives. Most of us are really good at cleaning up the areas of our lives that everybody sees. Just like when you're going to have guests come over your house, everybody in your house goes into a panic to clean it real quick. (laughs) Clean up right quick. We got guests coming over. And we don't really clean. We shove. (laughs) We open closets and we throw stuff in it. Right? On the outside, it looked clean. It looked neat. But we really knew that there's compartments of our lives that are dirty. Each one of us probably, most likely, I'm going to say 99.9% of us all have a junk drawer somewhere at our house. There's batteries in that junk drawer. There's rubber bands in that junk drawer. There's paper clips in that junk drawer. There's a remote to something that we have no idea what it's to in that junk drawer. We dare not throw it away because one day we'll figure out. And when we need the batteries, they'll be there too. (laughs) There's band-aids in that junk drawer. There's a bunch of stuff. There's no order to it. We have no idea where they are in the junk drawer, but it's somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. And we all got a junk drawer in our life. Behaviors that nobody sees that we're really good at hiding, but we deal with them. We struggle with them. When we may pull that behavior out every now and then and play with it, when no one's looking, and we'll put it back in that junk drawer secretly. Things like anger. Anger might be in your junk drawer. Unforgiveness might be in your junk drawer. Some sort of addiction to an alcohol or a drug may be in that junk drawer. Some sort of relationship might be in that junk drawer. Maybe bad words, that might be in your junk drawer. Maybe an addiction to something that's on the internet is in your junk drawer. And you're good at keeping it in the junk drawer for a while, but it's there. Then it calls to you because it's there. See, it can't call to you when it's not in the house. It's like I got these Girl Scout cookies in my house right now, and I know they're there. Samoas. 
and all their coconut goodness. And they call to me from the drawer, from the cookie drawer. They call to me, right? I'd say today that Jesus wants to remind you that you once were a dirty container, but he cleansed you. He cleansed you. He purified you with his word. He put a new wine within you. The best that anyone's ever seen, the best that anyone's ever tasted, the best that the world has ever experienced, he put within your life. And he didn't leave you half full. He didn't leave you half empty. He filled you to the brim. He filled you to a place of overflowing. And then he wanted to come in and he wants to flip some things upside down that you've made staples and fasteners in your life. He wants to boot some stuff out that you've been hiding in different areas. And no judgment, but in love, in grace, in truth, in purity. He wants to remind you that you don't need those anymore. You don't need that crutch, you don't need that thing that you run to when you're having a really stressful day. You don't need to run to that drawer and pull out that coping mechanism again. He says, I'm here. I want to clean the junk drawer. Father, we thank you today that you would speak to us in a true and living way. That you would take a very practical, in-house message and you would cleanse our heart with it. You'd cleanse our life with it. That there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That we would not feel condemned by you searching our hearts, but we would feel liberated. That we'd feel set free. That we would feel the joy of the Lord and it would be our strength. That we'd feel the peace of God that surpasses all understanding as we surrender our junk to you. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our comforter, for sticking to us closer than a brother, for never leaving us or forsaking us, but being the voice of encouragement when we feel far from God. We ask you today, God, to clean us up a little more. Show us how to overcome the barriers in our lives, how to dispose of anger, Dispose of unforgiveness. Dispose of resentment. Dispose of fear. Dispose of a lack of faith. And help us to live the life that you've designed for us today. We stand here before you, ready for a cleaning. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you.